Experts say that regularly experiencing a feeling of awe and wonder positively impacts your mental health. This is one of the most breathtaking moments I think of my life. <laughs> I, for one, can say that this is one million percent true. Putting myself in situations time and time again where I am blown away by how small I am, how beautiful life is, and how deeply appreciative I am for just simply being alive is crucial to keeping my cool. The thing about awe and wonder is that no one tells you it is right at your fingertips. Yes, the towering snow-covered mountains and vast ocean swell is enough to make your knees buckle. But it is the moments in between that really add up. It is laughing until your stomach hurts and cheeks quiver. It's running up and down the shore just to feel the wind through your hair. It is a good meal after a long day of work, trying the most unique drink you have ever had, and being surrounded by people that lift you up. You don't need to sail the world to be immersed in wonder and awe. I won't say it doesn't help, it does. But starting today, right now, you can begin to live for the in-between. Watching Port Townsend to come into view as we tacked our way up the Puget Sound was a special moment for all of us. As we approached, it brought into view the coast lined with cliffs and beautiful Victorian buildings, small wooden boats sailing to and from the harbor, and a breathtaking backdrop of the town's paper mill and the Olympic Mountains. In 1972, Captain George Vancouver discovered this well-protected and accessible harbor and named the area Port Townsend in honor of a friend. As the town grew, the maritime economy did as well. The continual ship traffic and turnover of crews meant that saloons, brothels, and gambling halls became a necessary evil. Non-seafaring families took up the area above the cliffside in an effort to insulate themselves from the rough and tumble environment of the bay shores. During the mid-1800s, over 300 stunning Victorian homes and buildings were built, most of which are still taken care of today. Waterfront pizza! <laughs> Look at that. Oh, yeah. See, I got fewer veggies, so it's better. Yeah, fewer veggies <laughs> is always better. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I do have mushrooms. But oh, you do have okay. mushrooms, yeah. You have a whole lot. Oh, you have weight. This is like artichoke, know. garlic, sun dried tomato. And actually, it's kind of like piled on there, yeah. The paper mill, visible from the shoreline and smellable from anywhere, depending on where the wind is coming from was built in 1927 and is in great part what supported Port Townsend through the Great Depression. In 1931, a proposal was accepted to build a harbor to accommodate small boats, and soon after, the harbor you see here was built in Port Townsend Bay. Today, Port Townsend and its population of 10,000 is one of only three Victorian seaports in the National Register of Historic Places. The harbor itself is filled with owners maintaining and living aboard their vessels, most of which are built of wood. Walking the docks among the beautiful floating history lures me away from the thought of fiberglass and into the idea of building a wooden ship myself someday. Don't tell Seawind. The shipbuilding community here is thriving and the boatyard adjacent of the harbor is bustling with shipwrights building and restoring boats old and new. The yard here can accommodate boats of many sizes, including huge steel ships like this. While walking around, we stumbled upon a building I recognized. Leo Sampson is doing an incredible job of rebuilding the historic Tally Ho documented on his YouTube channel. This is the building she's in. He does a great job of showing the rich shipbuilding culture of Port Townsend. I'll link his channel on the screen and in the description. The beautiful scenery and historic buildings mixed with the boating culture makes Port Townsend one of my all-time favorite places I've visited.
But that, the Bambi was like, oh my god, it's Bambi. You know, meanwhile, in Alaska, it's, oh, it's just another moose. <laughs> After a couple of days of small projects, computer work, delicious food, and fighting the urge to stay here forever, we turned back to the task at hand. Just around the corner is the Strait of Juan de Fuca, a stretch of water notorious for its unforgiving headwinds opposing any vessel trying to make way towards the Pacific Ocean. The prevalent northwest winds coupled with the Strait's position lying northwest to southeast means that almost every day of the year has 20 plus knots of wind and the ocean swell howling down the channel. Our next stop is Port Angeles, just over 30 miles to the west, and we found a weather window with fairly calm but foggy conditions. And yes, the wind will be right on our nose. Oh, good morning. It is 7.30, and we all slept very well. We're gonna leave in about a half an hour. We're heading to Port Angeles today. It's 35 miles to the west. This is going to be our official beginning of making our way towards the Pacific Ocean. We will be sailing in the Strait of Juan de Fuca today. It's about a uh, hundred miles total. We'll do it in two, two steps. This one is gonna be 35 miles. And then the second day will be 55 miles and we're gonna stay in Port Angeles a, a couple days. Yeah, we're excited. Really excited to go sailing. But I wanted to mention something before we left here. So this boat behind me, right here, we pulled into the dock here and I recognized something about this boat and I saw the Sarka XL anchor on there. And I go over to the back and I look at the stern and sure enough, it's Panape. Well, I'm speaking to anyone who has ever watched a YouTube video from SV Panape about anchor reviews. Anchoring and anchors is a pretty hot topic in the cruising world. Everyone has their own opinion and different styles of anchors do things well and other things not so well. Steve, SV Panape, he releases YouTube videos. He puts out YouTube videos of him testing different anchors. When I was choosing the anchor for Sea Wind, I watched every one of his videos. He influenced me buying our Rockna anchor and it has served us well. And here we are, we pull in and we are right next to his boat. And then I met him. What a small world. Ever since coming to Port Townsend here, I just feel like there is such a connection that I have to this place, even though I w I've never been here until now. It is just a really cool feeling. All of our port lights, when I was doing our refit in Ohio, from Port Townsend Foundry. And here we are. The foundry is just right over there. It's just incredible. Another uh, YouTube channel that I've watched from the beginning, a uh, guy by the name of Leo. He is rebuilding, I think it's a 1910 gaff cutter. It's a wooden boat. And now he, he's finishing it in the boatyard right over here. We walked by and I took some photos of the building and stuff and you know, no one was around. But just to know that that old boat is in that building over there and, and everything that I've watched on YouTube is happening right over there. It's just pretty incredible. So that's what I have to say this morning. And we are leaving, we are excited, but someday Katie and I are gonna come back to this place, maybe in our own boat. Angeles, here we come. Oh, you got it. I got it. I said it right. We go now. We go. Never seen it before. 
Never seen that? Never turned on the radar? Not this radar. Oh, okay. Working many a radar in my, in my day, but not uh, on a boat. Uh-huh. This is cool. How's it feel? We are fi you are finally, for the first time, not in the Puget Sound. Not in the Puget Sound. It's uh, terrifying and exciting, and I'm not sure if it's more exciting or more terrifying, but this is awesome. <laughs> Having a great time. It's, uh, I don't know, does, bigger does, things to come. Does it make you feel nervous? No, no, this is exciting. Exciting, exciting yeah. Going into the unknown, because it's literally actually unknown. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. This is, this is a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah. First time experiencing fog on the boat too, right? Fog, radar, sailing, water, <laughs> everything. It's all brand new. Yeah, good. Is, yeah, really exciting. Well, it's a lot of firsts for us too, so. Good. Twenty knots left or twenty miles? Yeah, twenty point nine. Cool. Seven to the point. Eleven we've done so far. Going through a rip, and we're gonna snap. You can feel it. You feel the. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is a weird feeling. See one doesn't do that. Uh. Just over 10 miles to go. It's uh, what time is it? It's one o'clock. It's no, one. It's 12:30. The fog is just starting to burn off, and as we approach the coast, uh, heading into the Bay of Angeles, we see these Olympic Mountains, and this is one of the most breathtaking moments I think of my life. <laughs> We experienced quite a few different conditions today. Lots of different things happening uh, with wind and currents opposing and accelerations around different land features. So that was pretty cool. Uh, we're getting a feel for how, how some of the climates work around here. Hours of this has been amazing. Yeah. And terrifying and exciting. Just learning to steer in these waves. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's not like driving a car. No. You have to think about timing with everything, especially like when uh, when we're in seas like this. And if we were sailing, keeping forward momentum yeah. back through the wind, yeah. sometimes the waves won't let you. 
that'll come through. You have to really time it. I think one of the best ways to support like good mental health or just like, I don't know, combat any mental health issues is to regularly experience awe. And by experiencing awe, you realize how insignificant or like just small everything is or like how big and beautiful things can be. Like with no wind, just like no no wind. Our airspeed, true airspeed, four, four twenty, four thirty, and that's if you like no tailwind, no yep. headwind. Yep. And then and then speed over ground with no tailwind, no headwind yeah, would same. also be that. Yep. Yeah. Actually, so that's I'm gonna say about four hundred fifty knots. Four hundred fifty knots. Yeah. And so that's that's like what five hundred and fifty miles an hour. Yeah, close. It's that's fast. fast for a jet. That's yeah. like, I mean, what is it, 700 and something is off? Yep. Yep. And I've had a ground suite of 700 knots once. I had like a 250 knot tailwind. 250 knot mile per hour tailwind. It's ground speed. It doesn't matter what your ground speed is, it's all airspeed. Oh, you could go, right. You could technically be going faster than sound, but it would be across the ground, even though localized at the airplane. You're not feeling that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but it's fast, man. That's crazy. Yeah. Windy in there. This is going to be a challenge. You got this. Yeah, you got this. Just what we talked about, you know, um, the wind might do all the work for you, and then backing down would be your only uh, issue. And uh, hopefully, There'll be a adequate fleets and things that we can get off and stop us. Because I can stop us with the mid too. Yeah. You know? So. <laughs> Keep us out. Uh, yeah, start heading towards yeah. the cat. Yeah, it's just slowing us down. We were doing three knots still. Okay. Yeah, there we go. This approach was fairly tricky. We had a strong wind from behind, which makes slowing down much harder. There are two boats we needed to parallel park between, and someone came over to help. In hindsight, handling our own lines might have been easier. Katie throws him a bow line, and he should have continued walking with the boat as we came towards the dock and as we got closer, I'd have been able to jump off. He tied it off on the nearest cleat to him and it ended up pulling the bow towards the dock. The bow line then slips the cleat and Katie heroically keeps the bow off the dock. This could have been a bad situation, but he secures the midship line to the cleat and we bring the stern in with the new fulcrum being amidships. This is no one person's fault. It's a product of learning and it sure was a learning experience. Uh, okay, we're, we have our spring. Uh, put her okay. in forward and give her port rudder. Okay. Just idle forward. 
right? Got it. All right, a little more forward. All right, we're made. Good job. Yeah, thanks for the help. You see how much control you have from midship? Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks so much. I'm a normal Chinese fire drill. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry about not getting the... That's okay. No, the, the midship was the thing that saved us. The bow of any boat is usually the first to come within a line throwing distance from any dock. This tends to falsely secure successful dockage because if the bow line isn't handled with proper technique, the boat can be abruptly interrupted from what could have otherwise been a good approach. We have begun to learn the value of a properly placed midship line. The entire boat can be controlled from this one point of attachment, and we believe it should in most cases be the very first line you make fast. like that, giving someone on the dock the bow first, I don't know if it's the best decision. Having a long midship like this and throwing it to someone is better, but you know, you don't know. We actually haven't really encountered that situation before. Yeah. All, all I know is, you know, it just kind of like I've experienced seeing what at least our boat does when you have a midship cleat. And remember, Paul would always tell us that when you have control from your midpoint, you have control of everything. And with your engine and your rudder, then you can do whatever the hell you want. You can walk the stern in, you can bring the bow in. <laughs> well done, well done. You had me superhuman jumping from the boat to yep. walk on camera. Oh, yeah. She was like, I oh, made that's it, like, right. A Marvel comic, like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I say we shut her down. Huh? Oh God, I forgot that we were recording. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> I knew the second you put that up there was gonna be a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we made it. <laughs> wow. Holy cow. Good job, team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> That was exciting. Yeah. That was exciting. I want to see me jump. Oh, okay. Katie was a superhero for a minute. Okay, so once upon a time in the Twilight Saga by Stephanie Myers, there was <laughs> a character named Bella and Edward. There is a scene where Bella goes to Port Angeles with her friends to go like prom dress shopping. Okay, so they go to this little boutique and she's like totally not into it because it's just not her thing and she's new to Forks. So it really takes place in Forks but they drive out to Port Angeles for this dress shop to dinner and stuff. So Bella kind of just wanders off to do her own thing. She goes into a bookstore and buys some books and stuff and she's walking back from the bookstore and these drunk guys start harassing her. And then all of a sudden, this sick, fast Volvo. Hatchback. Hatchback. <laughs> <laughs> comes whipping around the corner and like spins out. And then Edward Cullen gets out of the car and stands in front of these Guys, in the movie, it's funny because, like, in the book, they describe it as, like, this brooding, like, you know, like, intimidating. There's something about Edward that just made these guys, like, run off, you know? And, but in the movie, he's like... <laughs> anyway, so then they just run off, and he tells Bella to, like, get in the car, like, and he's going to drive her home, right? And she is like, 
oh my god why is edward showing up here how did he know i was in this alleyway like by myself obviously he followed her so then he's like did you eat anything in the car like he's like driving really fast like and she's like holding on he's like did you eat anything he like whips in to a restaurant and it's this this restaurant in port angeles so they go into this restaurant and that is where she finds out that like he can read minds because in the car he was like you don't know what they were thinking and she was like you do but you i can't read your mind <laughs> so anyway they have dinner at this restaurant and she orders the mushroom ravioli oh and so we all have to get mushroom so ravioli. naturally we all have to get the mush bella's mushroom ravioli yes. from this is, restaurant oh is the menu item called Bella's, Bella's Mushroom? Story. Now it is, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it was like, it's a real restaurant in Port Angeles that has the mushroom ravioli, and that is where they filmed it. This was a scene from the very beginning, like one of the mo most beginning parts of the Twilight gotcha. first book. You're Edward. You're, no, you're Jacob. I'm, I'm, what? Bigger. <laughs> I'm Edward. Fine. For sure, I'm Edward. I got like the glistening skin. <laughs> Actually, you do have the beautiful skin. Parker there. is Edward and you're Jacob. Fine, I'll be Jacob. I'll be the meathead. Jacob Black, the werewolf. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Ooh, that is good. You better watch that. I'm gonna drink yours. <laughs> Wait, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> 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 Ooh, that's good. What are we doing today? We're gonna go find an adventure. We're in Port Angeles still. We just can't help but walk towards these mountains that are looming over us like magical creatures. They're are some trailheads about I think two miles from us mm -hmm. so we are gonna go get some coffee and some snacks and we're gonna go on an adventure mm. pretty mm -hmm. look at all of them That's the most roses I've ever seen in someone's yard. Yeah. Really cool backyards around here. Good morning. Good morning. So we're about halfway to the Olympic National Park Visitor Center. This is where we're gonna get on a trailhead for some hiking. What better place to start with? In our first national parks. I can't even breathe. We haven't even started hiking. <laughs> the Olympic National Park in the very upper northwest corner of the continental <laughs> US. This is our first national park together. And what Lil Bum's trying to say is what better park than the Olympic National Park in the Olympic Mountains in the Pacific Northwest? Ah. Wow. They said that Olympic National Park on inside they said like all these things like incredible coastline views and all the stuff and they said the air quality here is incredible because like look at all the ferns. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, look at all these ferns. Mm-hmm. Mm.
new trees growing from old dead trees. This is like my old life, my new life. <laughs> She's dancing and prancing through the woods. Oh yeah, don't fall off the cliff. of a creek. How do you feel? Tired. Yeah. I am going here. Our total ascent was 1,074 feet, and our total descent was 344. I mean, sorry, 341. Excuse me, I burped. And the elevation we're at right now is 1,230 feet. You got to do the whole thing in reverse now. This is going to be mostly down, though. We've already done, what, over a mile on the way back now. This is kind of a cool spot. That bird. <laughs> Look at my own half. Yeah. So we're up on the top here. This is, we're gonna start descending down pretty steep now. And uh, it's kind of cool because you can really see way down. I mean, we're up at the top of these pines where they actually have their needles and the trunks below are bare for about 50 to 100 feet. It's wild. This is a steep incline now. These switchbacks. See, here's one right here. Switching back. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we're gonna put a switch back here. Just so someone can go, we're switching back. Switching back. The trail's pretty narrow and look at this.
job. Give me a smooch. We did it. Peabody Creek Trail. Nailed it. Woo -woo. We're at about six miles right now. Six miles today. Just the hike and not counting the two miles, two, almost two and a half. We from, did the, from the boat. From the boat to the visitor center. So. Uh -huh. All right, good job. Let's hike out. Let's go get some water.